All right, and welcome back to the Mental Health Toolbox. I am Patrick Martin, your host, and today we're talking all about self-care. So in this episode, we're going to cover actually six areas of self-care. So stay tuned, and I hope you get something out of this. Great. Thank you so much. All right, welcome back to the Mental Health Toolbox. I am Patrick Martin, and I am here to teach you ways to improve your thoughts, your emotions, and your behavior so you can live a quality life and do more than just cope, but thrive. And today we're going to be talking about six areas of self-care and more specifically, um, actionable things, right? So not just how to take a shower or why taking a shower is important or why you should get six to eight hours of sleep. But a lot of the things that we don't necessarily carve out the time to do for ourselves and to make sure that we are protecting that time and um, not just kind of putting our last fruits toward those areas of our lives, okay? But before we jump in, I think it's important to think about what self-care is, how we talk about it, you know, and semantics, and how we how we visualize that in our own lives. Um, When I'm talking to clients about self-care, oftentimes I'm talking about what makes sense in their environment and what makes sense for their needs, right? Because what, what works for me may not work for you, right? I love podcasts. For me, listening to a good podcast while I relax or go about my business is an act of self-care. But for somebody else, they may not have any interest in podcasts. So it's really important that we think about what is relevant. So as we cover all of the topics that I'm going to go through with you today, I want you to kind of take some notes if you can, or a mental note, and think about what is relevant to you, so that you can kind of circle back to that later when you have time, or even thinking ahead about how these things might be applicable to you. Okay, so um, an example for me, you know, things that I find meaningful, you know, or within my own environment. And so oftentimes people think about self-care, they think about, oh, that means I have to go out and do A, B, or C, um, and I don't have time for that, or I don't have money for that. But really self-care is about use of space, use of time, and use of space. So thinking about what you have already within your environment, within striking distance of your day-to-day routines, what you can do to really kind of do things just a little tweak, right? A little tweak and uh, to really add value to your life, your day-to-day quality of life. Um, Give you an example, you know, some time ago, my wife bought me a a hammock. I love hammocks. I've always wanted a hammock. A couple, uh, some Valentine's Day, three years ago, she bought me a hammock. Um, And, you know, it's freestanding. It just sets up on, on its own frame. Um, and it's, you know, the frame sits outside and it, you know, I package up the, uh, the hammock itself and put it in the garage so it doesn't get dirty and whatnot. Um, but oftentimes it wasn't used that much until this whole quarantine stay at home thing started and we all started working from home and all of a sudden I took a mental note and I, I noticed it more and so I hung it up and it has actually been really neat because my kids love it. I love it. And it's just something that was always in my environment, but I just didn't see it. I didn't observe it, didn't register as something I could just do on a regular basis because it wasn't part of my routine. Um, Other things that come to mind uh, within the environment, you know, is coffee. You know, for me, I am, I've always been an avid coffee lover. It's something um, that's always been a part of my morning routine since as long as I can remember, even into my teens. Um, And so for me, you know, not just making a cup of coffee, but I've developed a routine where I use a coffee press and, you know, I add a little cinnamon and, you know, I I try and savor it. And so what what I'll do is I'll try and actually get up a little bit earlier in the morning so that I have the time to really savor my coffee. And that's an act of self-care, right? It's not just rushing out the door with your thermos and pouring coffee into it and then, you know, trying to slam it before you start your day. It's really about protecting that time to make sure you have uh, adequate time to really savor it and, you know, wake up your mind and 
reflect on the day and project what you want your day to look like. So it's more than just coffee. It's about the mindset around that activity. Um, same thing with tea, you know. I uh, This last year, I have really, as I cut down on my caffeine, <laughs> um, you know, I'll have my two cups in the morning of coffee, but then the rest of the day, you know, I've really gravitated toward loving tea. And I, was, I wasn't much of a tea drinker before last year, but it's something that I've uh, explored to, you know, as part of my self-care and, and reading up on blue zones. If you've never heard of blue zones, it uh, refers to the healthiest clusters of populations throughout the world, the people who tend to live the longest, they have the fewest health issues. Um, and one of the, the common threads, as I often look for our common threads when I'm doing research, is specific habits, actionable things that I can incorporate into my life. And one of those, one of those things was green tea. And so I picked up uh, the habit and I started getting green tea and I fell in love with uh, Tazo, you know, the brand. Tazo makes this green tea with ginger uh, tea that I just love. It's it's mild and it's um, easy to drink. And, you know, you can pour, pour in uh, boiling water a couple of times and use a tea bag twice. And it's just really become part of my stable, but also part of my self-care. It's tends to be how I end my day is with a couple nice uh, hot cups of tea and I might sip on some tea, you know, throughout the afternoon, but it's really been um, part of my ritual, if you would, uh, whether I'm at, at work at the office or working from home or in the home office or even just lounging on the couch. So tea is important to me. And, uh, uh, you know, reading, you know, they say uh, leaders are readers, right? And so reading has become a really big part of my routine. Not that I, you know, didn't read before, but carving, again, carving out time. So if it's not an audio book, then I'm reading a physical book, you know, and I tend to gravitate toward books that have practical advice. So your Dave Ramsey, your Pat Flynn, your Dale Carnegie, you know, actionable, you know, applicable information to improve my quality of life. And that tends to be my, my, my zone. Like if you follow my podcasts or my blog, or YouTube channel, then you know, I, I'm very, tangible. I'm a tangible kind of guy. I'm a tangible therapist. I tend to gravitate toward things we can we can do, we can act upon to improve our lives. And so for me, when I think about self-care, it's, it is uh, definitely sprinkled in there, you know, when it comes to the information I'm absorbing, you know, I'd much rather probably sit down and watch a YouTube video on how to improve upon something than maybe necessarily my favorite sitcom. Not that I don't like sitcoms, believe me, I do. Um, but I'm also very, you know, it's just I enjoy the uh, the practical wisdom, okay, and learning. Um, and, you know, it could just be something very passive, you know. We have a fish tank, and I've really, you know, over the years learned how to take better care of our fish, you know. So they, they live a while, and uh, they're healthy, and the tank's clean, and how to use the right filters. And, um, you know, our kids have grown very attached to our fishes. And so for me, just, you know, taking a moment to pause, you know, whether it's in the morning and I'm feeding the fish or if I'm just passing by the hallway and I, I see the fish tank, I'll pause and I'll just kind of, you know, pay some attention to the fish. And because it's very soothing for me to think about, you know, what, you know, just to appreciate life. And even if it's, you know, a fish tank, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot to be grateful for, you know, and just observing uh, and, and noticing our environment. Um, same thing if you're outside, you know, noticing the trees and nature, right? The fish tank is kind of like that for me. Um, another thing that, you know, we've been doing a lot more is our pat, you know, using our patio, you know, before when it's the hustle and bustle and the nine to five and, and working, um, we didn't really u- utilize our patio a whole lot in terms of relaxing, but since we've had the working from home and staying at home orders, definitely been uh, a lot more appreciative and grateful for our patio. And um, we put in a more patio lights and doing a lot of gardening and planting and um, just really that feeds that sense of gratitude, the attitude of gratitude, you know, for what we have in our home environment. And we've been using our little chimney and fireplace more that we got some years ago. That was really hasn't really been used that much, but it's been nice in the evenings to eat dinner outside with family or even uh, with my wife to enjoy a glass of wine or something by the fireside. It's really nice, you know, it's very enjoyable and it's a nice time, nice way to pause, 
you know, take opportunities, little, little pockets, you know, half an hour here, an hour there to really just pause and be still and enjoy your surroundings and your environment. Um, so I'm all about, you know, taking time to do that. Uh, and also cat naps, you know, that's something that's always been a staple in my life is taking cat naps and whether that's when I was working graveyard in college and, and sleeping on campus somewhere, taking naps in the car, even to this day when I, you know, between my therapy sessions and stuff, you know, I'll tell, I'll take a 10 or 15 minute snooze, you know, just to kind of recharge and pause. So cat naps are very effective for me. So off top of mind, those are just some things that, you know, I try and do as, as a regular part of my routine to kind of keep my, my baseline mellow. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in and we'll look at six areas and a little more depth of self care. And, uh, Hopefully you get something out of this that you find actionable or some tweak that you can make to uh, improve your quality of life. Okay, so let's get started. So, okay, the first area I would like to discuss with you is physical self-care. So first thing that comes to mind here is maybe diet, right? We think about diet and exercise. Well, diet is one thing that's really intrinsically tied to our mental health that we can't really ignore right? They say you are what you eat, right? That's no joke. Um, Diet can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And making sure that you're getting the right balance of your micronutrients and your macronutrients, right? Um, Might seem like common knowledge, but there's a reason there's professionals that specialize in this area because it's a little more elusive than it might sound. And how do we know we're getting the right fuel for our bodies and our mental health? And this goes beyond things like just managing diabetes or your cholesterol. This has to do with making sure that you're getting the right amount of omega fats and micronutrients and vitamin D and your Bs and um, taking care of your liver and your kidneys and your vital organs. And how do we know what foods accomplish what means um, isn't something I think that we just learn along the way. It's something that we have to actively pursue information that we have to really dig into and sink our teeth into. And then the other half of the battle is finding out how do we incorporate these foods into our daily life. And I think that's a a battle for everybody. It's finding your groove and how you make sure that you're getting these things and based on your preferences, you know, what works for you. So, you know, thinking about foods that help your liver, your kidneys, your brain, your lungs, um, and, you know, how to, how to incorporate that. And as well as maintaining healthy blood sugar levels and uh, your cholesterol levels, right? And just as important, making sure that you're hydrated, right? So it's not just about the food we eat, but also making sure that we're getting the right quantities of uh, liquid. And, you know, there's this, I think most of the research agrees that really we should be getting a gallon of water a day. You know, I'm I'm not a registered dietitian. This is not, you know my advice to you per se, but this is definitely something that I'm passionate about is learning how to take care of my body. And, you know, I really strive to get that gallon a day of water and make sure I get my amino acids and sufficient amount of protein and all that good stuff. Um, And so there's a lot to learn there. So if you feel like diet is something that you avoid because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you or you don't really understand, I would encourage you, you know, take the time to do some research, you know, online Mayo Clinic or WebMD or talk to your doctor or a dietitian about how you can really develop the healthiest, you know, cornerstones in your diet. Again, you know, I like to research those blue zones and look for common threads of staples in their diet and what works. Uh, so it's not just about what you avoid, but it's also about what you incorporate, right? And mental health, we talk about those as protective factors. So it's not just things that we're trying to avoid, but things we want to make sure that we're attending to. The other thing is exercise. And this is a very, you know, sometimes triggering topic for people because there's a lot of emotion tied to the idea of exercise, um, especially in conjunction with diet. And you know, there's nothing extreme here, in my opinion, you know, when it comes to your mental health, you know, I, it's easy to get into that black and white thinking that I have to be going to the gym five days a week, or somehow I'm a failure in this area. No, no, no. You know, again, going back back to the idea, what research shows is just making sure that we're getting an adequate amount of walking in, or exercise of some sort, and that's consistent. See, consistency is really king. And um, this is where the whole, uh, 
you know, step trackers and watches come in is that, you know, it reminds us that, hey, we haven't hit our 10,000 steps yet. So that's something we really want to make sure that we're attending to. And, you know, for me, you know, as, you know, I had my second, you know, child, you know, it was my first child, but uh, my wife's second child, when she was born, you know, I stopped going to the gym because it wasn't really easy anymore. I, you know, it, you know, it, when you have a kid, it changes things. And so, was whereas before, I was avidly going to Gold's Gym and trying to do the early workouts before I went into the office, uh, getting up at five in the morning and whatnot. And, you know, it was not really an option once after I had kids as I needed to be more present. And so I, you know, eventually gave up the gym membership and I had to look for ways to really scratch that itch again, but in a different way and making sure I was getting my exercise. And it took some trial and error, different things, different routines. But eventually I stumbled on jump roping, which is something I'd never done previously. And a shout out to Jump Rope Dudes on YouTube. Um, I found that channel and it was really a game changer for me because it, I discovered the power of jump roping and mostly out of its convenience, but also because it packs a powerful punch and making sure that you're getting the adequate amount of exercise and that's very doable. You can take a jump rope just about anywhere. You can do it indoors, outdoors, and that in conjunction with the exercise routines and the motivation from watching the YouTube channel, it really helped me develop a new habit that kind of helped check that box with exercise. Now, again, not the all or nothing black and white thinking, you know, it doesn't have to be just about jump roping. If I am not really feeling that, I can go for a walk, you know, and making sure I get my 30 minutes of walking in a day. Now, I don't, I don't usually hit that, but I try and I'm a work in progress, but understanding that it it's about goal pacing, you know, if we can't do the ideal then what's the next best thing? If I can't jump rope, then what's the next best thing? Maybe I can go for a walk. If I can't go for a walk, maybe I can do some push-ups, right? So it's that whole idea of pacing out your your self expectations so that you don't get stuck in that stinking thinking, right? And you start shaming yourself and then it's not very productive. So exercise is the second part of the physical area that uh, I just want to bring your attention to. And, uh, you know, I encourage you to find a, um, a way to make that really doable in your life. And just it's okay to play around with different ideas until something sticks, All right? Medical care. This one is just, you know, just want to run this by you. You know, medical care. Don't forget to get your annual physical. Um, check in with your doctor unless you have any special medical needs where you need to, to see the doctor more often. You would know about that. But definitely just make sure you're not neglecting that annual physical, your blood work, you know, um, there's a lot of things that the blood shows that, you know, we don't want to miss. And so things like your blood sugar, your cholesterol, um, those are things that we can physically take action on. And there's enough information really out there that we know how to attack these things. And so um, we want to start at least with the basics and know, you know, what we have control over and focus on that. Okay. The other thing I would encourage you to do is, you know, just make in the in the medical areas to make sure that you're, you know, getting your annual dental stuff and your dental cleanings and making sure that you're checking that box. Because these are things that for most people are within reach and are not fun, but they're things that we can easily put on our to-do list, right? And make sure that we follow up with. It's just taking the mental note to do it. All right. Um, the other thing with the physical area of self-care is time off. So making sure that we change hats from when we are not in the office or not working, um, that we are really taking time to take time off and, and focusing on how we maximize that time and prioritize it so that we go back to work ready and recharged and not building toward burnout or feeling resentful. You know, even for me, you know, whereas I have my full-time job and also my private therapy practice, um, and I also do my, you know, my podcast and YouTube on the side, my blog. Um, it's, you know, even though I'm doing those other things and I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of it and being of service, there is, uh, still the mentality that I, I need to remember to carve out downtime as well. And so 
making sure that I'm still getting adequate rest and I might burn the midnight oil here and there as any entrepreneur does. Um, but making sure that I'm not doing that night after night after night because that's not sustainable. And then you end up not being as productive and there's always fallout. So I just want to make sure that you're being mindful of how to toggle that piece. Okay. And so that you are taking time to really decompress and so you can show up as your best self, you know, and making sure you know what you need. Some people need more rest than others, but it's also about making sure that you know um, what really grounds you and where you where you feel relaxed and you can decompress. And so whatever that is for you, make sure that you're carving that, that protected time into your schedule so that you don't um, approach any kind of burnout, okay? Okay, and so the other thing I want to touch on in this area is making sure that you are also indulging yourself a little bit. So more than self-care, this is that added little bit of pampering, you know, to make sure that you are you're uh, rewarding yourself for um, doing a good job and, and just from time to time making sure that you are uh, indulging yourself, whether that, you know, might be a day at the spa or a mani-pedi or a massage or something that, um, or an extra long bath with some bath salts, uh, you know, definitely, uh, something I would encourage, uh, my wife, you know, we have this, uh, little foot massage, uh, Kendall, I had gotten her some time ago and add a little bath salts to that with, uh, some essential oils of lavender and tea tree. And she has her own little foot spa at home. In fact, both of my, my, my girls, have uh, really taken to it as well. My five-year-old and 11-year-old love it. Um, And uh, I use it on occasion. A little self-disclosure. It's good stuff. You know, it's a great way to relax. Or if you even want to um, put the bath salts and essential oils into a bathtub or on a hot bath, it's a great way to kind of decompress and also detox. Um, So uh, I'll include, uh, as you can see on the, the description, I'll put some links in there. If you want to check out, you know, the stuff that I use, but, um, you know, it's another way to indulge yourself. So don't, don't forget about that piece. All right. And play, you know, making sure that we are having fun, right? It's a huge part of the human experience. And, um, we don't want to make sure we're neglecting fun. You know, what, what you find fun and what I find fun might be very different, but definitely make sure that you are carving out time for play. Um, So you are having that work-life balance, uh, whether that's, you know, indoors, outdoors, uh, just thinking ahead, looking at your calendar and trying to find the days and the times that you know you're going to have free and try and plan a little bit. You know, it's spontaneous. Spontaneity is good, but it's also important to make sure that we are planning and using our intention to make sure that we have play time. Um, Otherwise, it'll get swallowed up because there are so many things competing for our attention, that it's easy to just say, oh, you know, I wanted to go do this thing. I wanted to go to that garden or that nursery and, and look around. But you know what? You know, I have this other stuff over here I need to do right now. And so I'll just put that off again. No, I mean, it, something will always demand your time. So just make sure that you're carving out and planning out time for play and for fun. Okay, that's uber important for your mental health. Um, also, you know, in the physical realm, of course, sexuality and sexual gratification is a part of the package and making sure that that's, you know, understand that's also part of the human experience and that, you know, if you're in a relationship that uh, you're, you're taking time to attend toward the romance and the intimacy so that um, that's not neglected, uh, because that's a huge part of your mental health as well is um feeling satisfied in your relationships. And if you neglect that too long, that will show up in other ways as well. Okay, that's all I'll say on that. Um, Comfort, you know, uh, this is more about just being comfortable, you know, wearing comfortable clothes, uh, taking time to take a scenic way home, you know, roll down the window, you know, on your drive home. You know, the little things that you can do to just kind of ease your comfort level a little bit, you know, remembering to kick off your shoes when you get home and um, just being mindful of how you're physically feeling 
in your body and your clothes? Are you tense? What do you need? Um, are your pants uncomfortable? You know, it's okay to wear some looser pants. You know, it's important to feel comfortable, right? I'm not wearing a dress shirt right now. I'm wearing a you know a little sweater. So you know, you do you do what feels good in terms of your attire, but as long as it's appropriate in context, okay? Um, it goes a long way. All right, so that's it for the physical area. So this brings us on to the second area, which is psychological. In terms of self-care, uh, there are a few things I would like to touch on in the psychological area. And the first thing is reflection. Um, you know, you don't have to be a Zen master to really uh, understand meditation, but, re- you know, taking a time to reflect on your day and also project your day is important. Um, for me, you know, this is about, you know, before my head hits the pillow, thinking about just taking five minutes, even just thinking about my day and did it go like I planned and or hoped for better or worse? And if not, why not? And what are some things I can improve on if even by a little bit, you know, the following day, if they're uh, rather than beat myself up because I didn't get to everything on my to do list, it's more about just saying, oh, okay, so, you know, I, I could have responded this way different to my kid. You know, I didn't have to respond the way I did. Or how would I like to show up tomorrow? Uh, what are some things I would like to get done tomorrow? You know, this is about the projecting and what do I want to be my my priority and what can I do to make that happen? And how can I protect that time? And again, looking for that balance as you project, you know, thinking about what needs to be done, what's an option and what would you like to do, you know, and making sure all of those things are attended to and that you're doing things on purpose and for a purpose and with intention. Now, one note on this, not, I guarantee you, like nothing ever goes according to plan entirely, but as long as we have a framework for what we want to prioritize in our time as we project ahead in our minds, the more satisfied we will be at the end of that day. And so that's why this is, you know, mindfulness and meditation is so important for your mental health it's because it's about understanding your intention and what you have control over. And as you can, as you understand that you have that internal locus of control to kind of dictate to some extent what your life and, and day-to-day looks like, that's very empowering. And also to understand that the things that are not within our control, which leads to self-compassion, right? And understanding, Okay. So that's reflection, you know, um, like I said, it's just something you can do uh, before your, your head hits the pillow, reflecting back on the day, and also projecting forward on what you want the next day to look like. Um, I often use something called Google Keep Notes as a way to kind of keep track of my to-dos and wants and, and kind of slide those around in order of uh, preference, and so it kind of reminds me of what I want to accomplish. Uh, and you can also get up early in the morning you know, and reflect on your day and, and what you, you want it to look like. So I'm more of a night owl. As much as I admire the idea of getting up really early and, you know, before the sun rises and meditating, that, you know, that doesn't work for me very much. I'm much more like reflecting after the kids go down, um, the house is quiet, you know, the late, the late hours of the night. Um, then I can have a little quiet to think about uh, what I want to focus on and what's important to me and why. And for me, that, that works for me. You know, I just, I've just figured out I'm not really an early morning guy. I do my best work at night, usually in terms of my mindset and my thinking and reflection. Okay. The next thing I want to note in this area of uh, psychology is it's important to get a person. You know, a person, meaning if, that's, if you don't have a spouse, uh, a therapist, a mentor of some kind. Um, but really you just need someone that has an unbiased, non-judgmental, objective point of view that you can bounce things off of and that will help you solidify your intentions. Um, and that has your best intentions at heart. In addition, it really doesn't hurt to have friends who will offer you their advice. Just make sure you have a good balance of people that, uh, are kind of more of a neutral mentorish type support and people who are just going to give you their direct advice. Okay. 
So the next thing I would encourage you to think about in terms of your psychological health is journaling, okay? So this is nothing new. Everybody's heard of journaling, keeping a journal, keeping a thought diary. And it's pretty well accepted at this point that writing down your thoughts and feelings is a good way to, uh, it's cathartic and it's a good way to decompress, right? Um, so why don't we all do it? <sighs> That's a little more challenging than it sounds. Even though we know it's good for us, the problem is it's not always convenient to take the time to sit and write out our thoughts, right? Here, I just want you to find an easy way to express your thoughts and feelings and to get them out of your head and onto paper of some sort. For me, even even I, I'm not, I'm not big on journaling so much. Um, but what I do do is I take notes on my phone, um, usually through Google Keep Notes, and I will write down thoughts that I find meaningful or observations that I make within myself and any contradictions in my behavior and my goals. And that helps remind me of what's important and what to focus on. Um, and working with my therapy clients, I will oftentimes have them keep a mood scale uh, or um, a worry journal for anxiety as a way to kind of hone in on what's, con you know, to make those links between contributing factors and their mood as well as their coping behavior so that they can start to, to connect the dots between um, A, how they're responding to stress, but also the protective factors, what's helping them de-stress and what kind of external factors contribute to both their stress level and coping behavior. All right, and so like I had mentioned before, you know, when it comes to psychological uh, self-care, reading is really important, I think, to make sure that we are taking time to incorporate uh, reading for not just entertainment, but also for inspiration and to uh, attend to our critical thinking and reminding us of what's important and also how to grow um, in, in personal development. And I, and like I said, I'm very big on practical wisdom, so I tend to gravitate toward those types of books and, and actual information. If you want to see a list of uh, some of my recommended or favorite books around a personal development or for learning about specific areas like anxiety, depression, relationships. Um, you can definitely check that link out in the description and uh, you can take a look and see if there's anything there that you might be interested in, in terms of uh, picking up something new to learn um, and grow. All right. Uh, and also, you know, I think it's important that we get outside of our bubble, you know, our day-to-day -day routine and, uh, you know, they say variety is the spice of life. And it's really the idea that, you know, if we can just tweak things by 10% and keep some uh, spontaneity in our lives that way, it really tends toward our sense of happiness. A lot of research has shown that uh, when we find ways to do new things and expose ourselves to new environments, that it creates new pathways uh, in, our, in our minds that uh, lend toward a state of satisfaction and happiness so um you know don't don't negate the idea the importance of getting outside of your routine a little bit it's okay to do new things and try new things and uh even if it's just going for a walk down a different street than you normally would okay so step outside your bubble and also decompress. You know, I want you to think about um, ways that you can take time to do those things that you've been putting off to decompress, you know, in the sense of self-care. If you've been wanting to take that nice, long, uh, hot bath with uh, your favorite book or music, you know, do it. You know, look at your calendar and figure out a time to make that happen and give yourself permission and then do it. Take that walk, take that bath, uh, get that massage, get that pedicure, um, read that book or see that movie. You know, these are things that I really want you to make sure you're not neglecting too long. Um, because when we do take care of ourselves, our body thanks us for it. And it actually allows us to show up as our best selves in other areas of our life. Okay. When we're, when we decompress, 
we're less stressed. When we're less stressed, we impress, right? We impress the people around us um, by our improved attitudes and our decreased uh, distress tolerance, okay? Um, and I would like you to show off, you know, more than one dimension of yourself, you know? Um, we tend to behave in specific patterns with familiar people. And consider those aspects of yourself that you have not necessarily displayed for a given company. Um, and find ways to share more than just a, you know, to share more of a 360 view of your character and all of its beauty. Because we, t- we tend to, to have uh, fall into certain roles or behavioral patterns with the same people that we hang out with. And they may not have any idea that you like a particular subject or you have a particular talent or skill set because it's never come up in conversation because that's maybe just not something that you have attended to in your behavioral exchange, right? Um, But it's important to make sure that, hey, you know, I've been hanging out with this friend for 10 years and they have no idea that I'm into wood art. I don't know, just making that up. But it's important to make sure that you are thinking about those things so that you can really give people a 360 view of your personality and your character. And that's good for your mental health to be able to, you know, show all parts of your being and to shine, right? And to, to feel confident and to be able to share, just sharing uh, who you are, as long as it's done safely and with safe people. It's uh, very cathartic. Okay. And I would also have you take note of your inner experience. So this goes back to that reflection, right? Reflecting on your day and did it go as you had hoped? And if not, why? And what did you learn about yourself, you know, throughout the day in your reflection that you can praise yourself for or that you can improve upon tomorrow? Okay. All right. So the next part of the psychological area of self-care is challenging our intellect. So it's important to stay stimulated, right? Like we talked about reading, staying inspired. And if you feel like you're growing tired of your routine, it's probably because you're not being challenged enough. Consider what you take on of interest and that it is somewhere between your comfort zone and that delusional unrealistic zone. By this, I mean, learn to challenge yourself. So if you feel like you're plateauing, like with your routine and that you're just kind of things that used to be hard anymore, just, you know, not, not so challenging. Um, if you feel like you're, you're setting up camp in your comfort zone, think about things that you can do that will challenge you, your intellect or your skill set again, a little bit more, right? Those, uh, growing pains are important and it's, it's an ongoing process because we're never done growing. It's important that we continue to find ways to challenge ourselves, you know, and, um, it's not always fun and comfortable, but usually we are happy we did, right? It's good for our self-confidence, for our sense of adequacy to take on new challenges and to learn new skills, okay? Um, and also to be receptive, you know, be receptive with open mind, open ears, and to stop, take a step back and observe, right, our environment, to read the room, to engage and then proceed mindfully, right? So this is part of that psychological skill set is learning to be less reactionary and to observe more without judgment and in any situation be able to process before we react, before we open our mouths and give an opinion or feedback to really think about what's going on, what's in play, and what are the moving parts before we make a judgment or respond to a situation. So being receptive and observant, and also to be curious, okay? So consider the possibilities and be open-minded, um, and that you might be embarking on new territory, and could you could be pleasantly surprised, right? Before You know, this is the thing about being non-judgmental, is that when we're curious and open-minded and we, we see possibilities and opportunities, and we remove the judgment from the perceived outcomes, oftentimes we are able to experience things that we wouldn't otherwise uh, have encountered because we would have avoided 
Um, and this is true in relationships. This is true in everyday opportunities and um, things that we would normally decline or turn down. If we just create a little bit of of wiggle room for uh, to be open minded, we might be pleasantly surprised. So just a thought. OK. So that's, you know, it's important to be curious. And uh, lastly, when it comes to psychological self-care, it's important to say no. Just like we say yes when we're curious, it is important to know when to say no. And if you want to protect your time for self-care, it's important that we learn to say no so that our time is not just given away and we're left without enough time for self-care, okay? So yes, it's good to be generous, but please leave some room in your time budget to spend on the unwritten and uncommitted opportunities for expressing your creative areas of self-care, okay? Okay, so this brings us on to the next area of self-care, which is emotional self-care. And there's just a few things I would like to touch on with you here, and the first of which is the importance of spending time with other people. So remember that old saying that nobody's an island? Well, it's true. We are created to be social beings, and it's important that we learn to find healthy ways to interact with other people and to socialize. As much as we feel like we might be introverts and we don't need anybody else or human connection, on some level, everybody needs human connection, okay? And it might, you know, have something to do with past trauma, past fallout from relationships, being emotionally hurt, that we shy away from relationships. But ultimately... We can't avoid them, or if we do, it's usually at a, at a great cost. And so I would have you just try and think about, if you have had fallout from your past relationships, what have you learned from that in terms of what your needs are, and how can you create healthier interactions in the future moving forward, knowing what you bring to the table um, and what pitfalls have interfered before in relationships. But really, it's important to think about how we can maintain a certain level of socialization, okay? It's really important for your mental health. And, you know, for being honest, we're designed as social beings, okay? So that's important. Okay, so the next area I would like to touch on in emotional self-care is the idea of staying in touch. Much like the, the idea that we need to stay social, it's really the idea that we, it doesn't take a lot of effort, right, to maintain social relationships, just the consideration to check in on occasion, right? It doesn't have to be anything big, um, but it may help to set a routine. Because if you're like me, I'm very out of sight, out of mind. And so, you know, if I'm going to stay in touch with someone, it really helps if I think ahead of time of how I might re- set reminders to check in with that person. You know, whether it's a certain day of the month or a certain month out of the year, um, to, you know, just take the time to make a short call or send a text, and uh, this could be in conjunction with other activities that you would normally be doing, um, so you don't, you're kind of doubling down on your time. Like when I used to have an hour commute to work, that's when I would do most of my phone calls to family and friends as to check in. I'm already in the car, uh, so that time's already kind of protected, if you would, uh, so I would use that time to check in. Now, since I don't really commute that far anymore, it is something... uh, that I've had to work on more since I, I don't have that habit anymore because I don't have a commute. All right. So also uh, get affirmative, right? This is more of uh, positive psychology, self-affirmations. Um, this is really about checking in with yourself in terms of your self-talk and making sure that you are at the very least being fair in your statements of self, statements to yourself, how you're talking to yourself. At the very least, the things that you're saying in your mind about yourself are factual, okay? And uh, when possible, to try and frame your self-talk in terms of questions, right? If you're ever feeling stressed or anxious. Um, And if you can, to show self-compassion in your self-talk. There's a ton of research really linking self-compassion to positive mental health, right? To seek understanding instead of blame, all right? The next thing I'd like to touch on is practicing self-love. 
right? This is more uh, than just the self-talk piece. This requires physical action, and this is a big part of self-care, and being sure that you're paying attention to what your body is telling you. If your neck is tense and your muscles are aching, that's if your eyes are tired, that's your body sending you signals that you need some extra TLC, right? You need to do a little something extra than just the norm to take care of yourself. And so that might mean, like I said before, like for me, when my eyes get tired, I take a 15-minute cat nap, right, to rest my eyes, whether that's in my car, on the couch, wherever. And it doesn't require a whole lot of me. And, you know, taking out 15 minutes for my day is not going to derail my schedule, you know what I mean? It's just going to help position me to um, follow through on my plans, right? without uh, feeling burnt out by the end of the day. All right. And um, I would also like to have you think about, you know, when it comes to your emotional health, your emotional self-care is how we can repeat what works, right? Repeat what works. And in this, I think about replay, you know, replaying effective coping. And by by this, I mean, ask yourself questions like what has worked in the past, uh, Because the chances are, if it was effective before, it will be helpful again. And that resuming an old, healthy routine with a little tweak um, is an easier place to start than jumping into some entirely new activity uh, or coping skill or or self-care. And this is because the process of incorporating a new habit and learning a new skill, you know, and to find a way to then work that into your schedule in a sustainable way, can be emotionally and mentally draining and very hard, actually, when you are battling depression or anxiety. But it, even if you're not depressed or anxious, trying to find a way to incorporate new habits into your life is exhausting to some extent because it requires a lot more mental RAM, right? A lot more, rent, you know, it takes up a lot more mental space to really vi- envision what that looks like and then to, to tweak you know, your behavior and your routine to find a way to make that happen, um, it's exhausting, right? You might YouTube five, 10 videos before you figure out, you know, how to make some, how to make a green smoothie, right? If you're not used to doing a green smoothie, it could take a lot of time and mental energy to really think about what that looks like. Well, can I use my blender or what do I need to make a green smoothie? What goes into my green smoothie? Do I need to, what kind of vegetables do I need? Do I need to wash the vegetables? So, you know, so if you're not used to it, it can take a lot more time than if you're just, you know, you have a favorite salad at the grocery store and all I have to do is, you know, pick up that salad. Um, Just an example. Okay, so another thing I'd like to touch on is how to identify and seek out safety and comfort, okay? So what is your safe place? You know, you think about when you're stressed, what environment, what place do you feel protected and safe? And who are your safe people? You know, who makes you feel safe? And trying to create a high definition HD picture of what this place and these people look like when you're feeling tapped out will make it easier to act on them, meaning it'll make it easier to create that environment in your life or to plan or call those people or recreate that environment when necessary. Okay, and think about how you'll get there and how will you solicit that kind of support that you do need, you know, that whether that's practical, spiritual, direct, unfiltered feedback or just a shoulder to cry on. So the next thing I'd like to touch on in emotional self-care is the importance of making room to cry. So it used to be a societal norm where men were not allowed to cry, right? It, It was just taboo. And not only has this societal norm remained static, it's actually now kind of applied to both sexes. Uh, You know, the same expectation where women and men are both held to the same unrealistic standard that crying is not okay. It's not okay to express or have your emotions. Um, But rather, as we understand it in mental health, crying is very cathartic. It's a cathartic behavior, and it allows space to vent... Um, and decompress. And crying is a crucial part of your self-care regimen. You know, be, or having some 
some means of expression, or at least the freedom to feel that you can express yourself as needed, and that it's not a sign of weakness. Um, it's actually a strength. And that, you know, we do so in a safe kind of social, socially accepted environment, whether that's over a glass of wine with your best friend, or if that is, uh, you know, with your partner, you know, whatever, whatever this, the case is that you feel that you're, you're allowed and it's safe to express yourself. That's really important when it comes to your mental health um, and emotional self-care. Okay, so the next thing I want to touch on is the importance of having a sense of humor, right? So having a sense of humor is a really important part of uh, self-care, especially when you consider um, how easy it is to neglect that part of ourselves. You know, we can get so serious about work and the hustle and bustle and all the things on our to-do list that we forget to just entertain that uh, that yeah, very human part of ourselves. And, you know, for me, it's really important just to laugh at myself and uh, take things in stride. But a good example of how I've applied this is, you know, when I used to have my uh, long commute back from work or to work, after a stressful day, I would oftentimes turn on the iHeartRadio uh, comedy station, and that was a great way for me to decompress, you know, so that by, by the time I got home, I was in a whole different frame of mind than I was, you know, before I left work. And uh, so it's important that you just, you know, don't neglect this part of yourself. Remember that old adage that laughter is good medicine. It's true. And well, that, you know, may not always be an easy thing to do when you're feeling stressed out. Taking the time to seek out ways to decompress through humor is really important and that might just mean putting on half an hour of your favorite sitcom after watching the news at night or flipping on your favorite comedy station um whatever works for you okay but it's really about being intentional and finding ways to maintain that sense of humor And uh, it'll also help you sustain a healthy perspective and to keep things in perspective if you try not to take yourself too seriously. And uh, this has definitely been a staple in uh, maintaining my own mental health. Okay, and the next thing I'd like to touch on in emotional self-care is uh, finding meaningful outlets that are bigger than yourself. So by this I mean uh, we don't have to dedicate ourselves to being you know, in a lifelong pursuit of becoming like Gandhi or Mother Teresa, but it is important that we find ways to serve others. So being of service, right? Being altruistic, doing things for the sake of their intrinsic value that have no direct relation to ourselves in in terms of being self-serving. This helps us maintain perspective and also to get out of our own head and out of our own problems specifically which allows the psyche to kind of breathe because we remember that the universe, the world, does not begin and end with us, right? The birds keep singing, you know, the sun keeps rising and setting every day, you know, regardless of our state of affairs, right? So it's good to get perspective by being of service. And um, another thing that's really helped me to maintain my mental health is to play with youth you know um i have kids and kids keep me young you know there's a saying that you know it keeps my mind aware of the inner child and how to get in touch even even if it's playing barbies with my five-year-old you know it reminds me of that mindset and you know kids they live very in the moment you know whereas adults we tend to ruminate about the past and we stress about the future we have more difficult being present but children they're all you know they have they have a lot of difficulty not being present they're so present-minded and that's why time moves so much slower for youth than it does for adults and it's not a bad thing to get in touch with that um through grounding right or being of service you know uh volunteering at the youth group at your church or um you know whatever means you can find to to remember what what that's like and stay in touch with that is important, okay? So this brings us on to the next area of self-care, which is spiritual, right? Spiritual areas of self-care, and this doesn't necessarily have to be religious, per se. This can just be about finding a quiet space to reflect 
and it only takes a few minutes a day to really focus on what's important to you and to reflect on how you're spending your time and to take stock of what's important and also how to prioritize your time and then that better positions you to ascertain if your behavior and your commitments are in line with your priorities and your values. Uh, that's really about, you know, for me, that's very spiritual about making sure that what we're doing is in line with our values and our value system so that we are being true to ourselves in that respect. Okay. Okay. And the next one is, is nature bathing. You may have heard of this term before, but nature bathing is really about, you know, whether it's a stroll through your local uh, forest or hiking trail, or just stepping into your backyard and taking a moment to acknowledge the nature around you. You know, for me, I have avocado trees in my backyard and it's really nice to go in the backyard and even if it's just to ad admire the sunlight peering through the, the branches and the leaves or if it's to feel the bark on the tree and just take a moment to appreciate the life that's growing around us, the, the green hues of the grass and the, the bright various colors of the flowers and um, the, the, the clouds in the sky. You know, it's about feeling the sun on your skin and just taking a minute to literally, literally bathe in the gratitude of the nature around us is a great way to practice self-care and remind us of the human experience that the experience extends beyond ourselves, that we share in concert with the rest of nature our physical environment and we get to participate in that and it's, it's good to remember that uh, life is made up of more than our own physical being and that we get to partake and participate in the existence of other forms of nature um, it's a privilege and it, it's a really great way to kind of ground ourselves into de-stress and get outside of our head and just in the moment okay and a lot of this is about being connected and being sure that we maintain contact with that kind of spiritual practice. Um, and this, again, can be through like a devotional journal. It can be through mindfulness, meditation, um, spiritual text, rosary beads, uh, talking with a spiritual counselor, meditating. Uh, and really the take-home point here is to be intentional, uh, be intentional about making time to acknowledge the spiritual aspect of our existence which can be very challenging when we have busy lives, right? And when there, there's a lot of things competing for our attention in this busy world, right? Okay, so that's what I'll say, you know, about the spiritual aspect of things. You know, definitely do try to take a moment to breathe in your environment and also to keep an open mind, you know, as you go about your daily business to um, try to refrain from that rigid, judgmental uh self-talk about your environment, even, even as you're responding and interpreting situations around you, um, try to seek understanding versus blame. I think you'll be better positioned to uh, be in a content state of mood when you get into the habit of doing that. All right, and that goes right in uh, hand in hand with keeping an open mind and um, as a way to protect your optimism. And that's the next point. You know, protecting our optimism comes with intention. And so we don't get jaded and start to see the glass half empty. And it's not an accident. People who are optimistic don't just, they're not just born that way. It's a skill that we exercise. And even if you ask someone who's optimistic, they may not understand that it's a muscle they've exercised over their lifetime. But it is really about how we choose to perceive things. It's not that optimistic people don't see the negative or they don't they don't acknowledge the um, the challenges in everyday life. It's that they see the whole picture and then they choose to attend to the uh, brighter aspect of things or the silver lining, um, as opposed to having judgmental statements of the self and. A, you know, in reaction to your environment. Um, and this can be done by choosing to feed that part of our optimism. This goes back to stimulus and stimulating ourselves with things that build us up and are praiseworthy 
right, about the human condition and the world around us, as opposed to just honing in on the negative. And then an example of this would be you could watch the 11 o'clock news, or you could watch a positive documentary, or you could listen to a, a positive podcast, you know, it's what we choose to attend to, right, is going to influence our frame of thought. And personally, this is why I love podcasts. It's very easy to choose and listen to a very specific kind of content, whether it's on the way to work or if I'm ending my day, as opposed to just listening to whatever's on the local radio or the local news. And I don't really have a whole lot of choice, then it's de- it's decided by uh, the media, right? As opposed to me taking action and choosing how I want to stimulate my frame of thought. And then, you know, there's the idea of focusing on the non-tangible, right? In a world where we have cell phones glued to our person 24-7, we have to make a concerted effort to really put our phones out of reach, uh, whether it's at the dinner table or with family, or I don't know if that's just me, but I literally have to make it a point to turn my phone face down behind me on a counter so that I'm not distracted. Even though I'm physically with my family, I have to... I have to physically get it out of my range of view, out of sight, out of mind, so I'm not then tempted to look at it, even if it's just out of uh, habit. Um, And unplugging helps a bit and gives us that undivided attention to the things around us so we can see the wonder in them. We can also give them the attention that they're due. And this can also lend toward a greater appreciation for the existence of of our fellow beings and environment, but also develops an attitude of gratitude. Okay, so focus on the non-tangible, meaning it's okay to get some distance from tech and from your phone and to be fully present in the room. Um, Just do that with intention and for a purpose. And that kind of goes in hand in hand with being an observer of your environment or a spectator, if you would. Um, And being uh, an active participant in your life is very important, but don't forget to take a step back from time to time and focus on taking in the scene of the room, reading the expressions on people's faces, you know, just being a a spectator and really kind of soaking, soaking in all of that in your environment and getting a feel for that. That's a really important aspect of emotional intelligence. And that's something I fear that the, this generation, next generation is at risk of being a little handicapped is if we, you know, we spend so much time on social media and our phones that our attention span dwindles, but it's also we're so easily distracted, whereas we aren't paying attention to our environment as much. We don't pick up on as much. We don't necessarily make the same connections and interpretations that we other, otherwise would because we're not paying as much attention. And so learning to be a spectator, I think, is a really important skill. All right. And then there's uh, seeking understanding. You know, when we try to gain better understanding of something or in resolving a dispute, it helps to be quick to listen and slow to speak, right? This puts us in a better position to make educated decisions and how we choose to proceed. And it really improves all of the areas of self-care when we do this. It's an active effort to really see the moving parts and why somebody's behaving the way they're behaving or responding the way they are before we make any, provide any feedback or make any judgments about the situation. Okay. I would also have you identify and prioritize what is most meaningful to you. This is a really important aspect of spiritual self, self-care and that it helps if we know what our non-negotiables are, what our core values are, and we allow those values to then inform our other decisions that we make in our day-to-day life. And you could look at this through your time of reflection that we talked about, your meditation, and try to identify the things that you hold most valuable in your life and keep a list to kind of check it against, like a check and balance, to later evaluate if you have been making decisions that are actually in sync with your value system. And also when projecting how you plan your days ahead to make sure that the time that you're allocating for the next day, for example, is in line with your values so that you don't end up 
with more regret when you don't get to the things that you would have otherwise preferred to get to. And so it's a big part of our spiritual walk, if you would, in terms of using our time with intention, but also a lot of, you know, with um, prudence, right? Okay. And uh, when we think about meditation as a part of our spiritual self-care, um, it's important, again, to think of it in terms of being proactive and intentional in that we're using that time to create a routine wherein we get that quiet, that solace, that empty space in our mind to then recharge and also refocus about what we want and how we want to create that in our lives and bring it to fruition. And as a therapist, my full attention is demanded really hour after hour in problem solving, seeking understanding, and assessing how and when to provide meaningful interventions. And in order to keep functioning at my best, and best serve the others around me to the best of my abilities, I have to create these small pockets of time where I have quiet during the day without any distractions. And when I neglect to do this, man, do I feel the difference. Because my eyes are heavier, uh, I get headaches, you know, if I don't take the time to really pause. And, you, you know, even if that's just to go to my car and rest my eyes for 15 minutes to decompress, it's really important because... Um, otherwise, we can tap out pretty quick. All right. So meditation, whatever that looks like for you, I, I strongly encourage it. Um, even if it's only a few minutes a day, it doesn't take much. All right. The next thing I would like to touch on is the importance of being expressive. So be sure that you have a creative outlet, you know, whatever that is for you. For some, it's art. For others, it's writing. For some, it's gardening, right? Having a creative outlet And um, that could even be a sport, right? Or some kind of interest, a very specific interest where you have a sense of adequacy and competence that you can build upon and that you can scale as a way to express yourself. And if you're, as long as you're investing some time into this expression of what is meaningful to you, then you're you're checking that box, right? Being, Being expressive. I would also encourage you to try and seek amazement, right? Seek ways to be kept in awe of the complexities of this human experience. Um, The deep complexities, right, of the universe and within ourselves. And to take time to stargaze. I love that. You know, it never stops blowing me away when I look up and I just take a really deep look at the stars. And I'm like, man, that is a trip, right? I mean, the universe is just, it really (laughs) puts things in perspective, doesn't it? When we think about our role in the universe, it's it's very humbling. Um, that could also mean uh, watching a new documentary, taking a road trip, or even just a day trip to a new place. It, it feeds that sense of amazement and inspiration right, and awe that we continually are able to surprise ourselves or take in um, our environment in, in different ways. And this is honestly one of my favorite areas of self-care is to keep myself stimulated and inspired. All right. And another thing to keep in mind is why it's important to participate in meaningful activities. And by that, I mean here you just want to be sure that you're plugged into something that is actually routine within your, that's also in line with your values that you can maintain, right, consistently. And this could be something like a church group, a volunteer service, a sports club, a league, or something to that effect. Something where you are physically participating, not just spectating. We talked about the importance of being a spectator, but it's also important to be our participant in other areas. Okay. And the last thing I want to touch on in this area of spiritual self-care is the importance of seeking inspiration, right? So by this, I mean, what tickles your fancy, right? For me, it is usually learning healthy lifestyle hacks, practical wisdom, financial literacy. And so I will subscribe to podcasts and blogs and YouTube channels that speak to these topics because they are the things that keep me inspired 
to, uh, up, you know, because I like actionable information that I can tangibly see the movement in my life and I, I can compare those milestones, right? And I almost always gain a new nugget of wisdom or at the very least a better perspective by listening to these things or watching these things that overall improves my mental health or at, le- at the very least keeps that at my baseline, right? Well, that's the spiritual self-care. I hope that piece was helpful. And next we're going to talk about the workplace, okay? Okay, so next I want to talk to you about the workplace and how we can practice self-care and managing our role, right, when it comes to our occupational obligations. And the first thing that comes to mind is protecting our break time, right? There's a reason we get a break time or the lunch hour or the 15-minute intervals is so we have a time to decompress, not so we can find more ways to work. Okay. I say this from personal experience. There's always the pull for me to try and get more done with my break time. And then even as a therapist, I have to learn to protect that time and use it wisely. Um, and I know it's harder for some than others, and it can be harder than it sounds, but try to be mindful of scheduling a couple breaks in your day to recharge. Okay, so you'll be better off for it, even if it's a 15 minute break, um, or a walk, or a power nap. Um, I like to nap in the car. So I try and mix it up myself, you know, because I have a sit down job, I'm, you know, I don't get much activity. So I do try and make sure that when I'm taking breaks at work, that I'm getting a walk in and I'm balancing that out with some other self-care. Maybe it's a 10 or 15 minute nap, but I do try and make sure that I'm doing um, both so that I'm taking a holistic approach to my self-care and my break time. Um, All right. And the next thing I would say is to make sure you're being social. So uh, I'm not suggesting that you procrastinate on your duties at work, right? Um, Such as like chatting up, you know, about the most recent uh, game or TV show, but try to make time to greet your peers in the workplace and by this I mean brief check-ins so just briefly check in with others when you have some downtime little gaps in your schedule and uh, dive into deep conversation a little more when it's appropriate but uh, within your work environment so by this I mean it's better to have many check-ins with your peers as opposed to trying to get into a deep conversation and get derailed. But if you have more time, such as, you know, in the lunchroom and you have a little more time to dedicate toward the deeper conversations, that's appropriate. But by no means do I want you to get in trouble for uh, chatting it up at work when you should be working. Uh, but you get the idea. So just take a, take a little effort to um, be social, you know, in the workplace when it's appropriate, if it's appropriate in your workspace. And um, also to create a quiet space, right? So... Options will vary based on your environment when it comes to creating quiet space. And, uh, but I found that taking 15 minutes in the day to just sit in my car and rest my eyes will make a world of difference in how I perform at work and also how I feel after work, right? I've mentioned this a few times. And that uh, it's really a small investment uh, in terms of the impact and quality, uh, the quality of life right, that you'll see improvement upon that extends beyond the workplace when we are just trying to make sure that we are decompressing a little bit throughout the day, okay? All right, so the next thing about the workplace is I would say try and seek engaging tasks, meaning that if your job allows some autonomy in your workflow, try seeking out new tasks that are both interesting and a reasonable challenge. Right, so learn a new skill set if you have the ability. So, if your job doesn't require a whole lot of Excel, but Excel is not something you're very familiar with, then try and learn a new skill. Why not? You know, um, or whatever you're into, and whatever your your job has potential, you know, for growth or to learn something new or take a new training. By all means, try and seek things that are engaging that keep you interested and motivated in the work that you do. Um, so I think that's important. Okay, so the next thing I would like to touch on is boundaries and how to maintain boundaries and why it's important. 
Maintaining boundaries with others and with yourself is important, and it will protect you from creating additional work-related stress and resentments down the road, um, such as some things I try and remember. You know, don't take your work home with you when possible. Uh, take your scheduled breaks. Don't offer opinions that are not solicited. That's a big one. And do not over-fraternize and do not completely isolate either. So by boundaries, I mean you have to find those that sweet spot between um, checking in with your peers but not getting sucked into conversation and also um, understanding that you know there's a time to work and there's a time to take a break and making sure those boundaries are clear and predictable and repeatable so that you uh, maintain a sense. You can feel when you're in balance, but you want to be able to maintain that feeling. That's not to say you won't be stressed at times or work harder sometimes than others because we don't have control over everything with our workflow, but there should be some predictability to it is what I'm saying. All right. On that same note, don't become lopsided. And by that, I mean... Remember what good old Jack Nicholson said, right? All work and no play makes Jack a boring guy, right? Um, If life is all about work, then it will start to feel very gray and empty after a while. You know, feeling productive is a universal positive factor in our mental health. Yes, but we must also take care to show moderation in all of our efforts. Okay, balance is not always mean like 50-50. Balance means we are able to assess and hone in on the things that we are neglecting. Like if we're working a lot and we're feeling like, hey, you know, my eyes are tired and I'm a little achy, I haven't taken my break yet. It means tapping the brakes on what we can to make time over here and attend to this other area of self-care that we've been neglecting so that we don't end up so lopsided because that will show up in other ways you know, and our behavior and our stress, okay? And then we will bring the stress home with us, which we don't want to do, right? And so um, just take care to make sure that you're balancing as much as you can and understand that, uh, yes, there will be deadlines, but workloads and deadlines don't necessarily have to outweigh our self-care. Make sense? And that we are making sure that we're attending to what's urgent and important, but also not not sacrificing self-care to just take care of busy work, okay? Um, but this is not the, ma- the case for the majority of people unless we have taken the time to create this dynamic, a healthier dynamic where we know uh, how to maintain self-care in the workplace. I would also have you maintain a refreshing workplace. By that I mean, you know, that, that old saying, cluttered space, cluttered mind, right? So um, also that saying cleanliness is next to godliness, right? I don't know if I would take it to that extreme. Um, But it certainly has been my experience that when I have an organized or semi-organized workspace that I'm less stressed, you know, it, I do feel like there is a relation between our physical environment and our mental health and how we manage it, right? Um, But again, a lot of it does come down to your personal temperaments and your your uh your flow as well for example i kind of have an aversion to paper right um you won't find any sticky notes around my desk however you will find a lot of digital notes on my phone via google keep or you know same thing on my desktop um as i like to keep an open kind of clean desk space uh however one of my best friends who's a colleague who's also uh quite the opposite. You know, she's she's a nurse and she has sticky notes all over the place. You know, it looks like a sticky note grenade went off at her desk. Yet that is her system. It doesn't stress her out. In fact, that's how she organizes her thoughts. So, by that I mean you have to you have to know yourself well enough to know how your process works, but works in a way that allows you to not feel you know, claustrophobic or stressed. Um, so if there's a method to your madness, by all means, but if it's just out of neglect, then that's something to pay attention to so that you can make sure that you're using your space wisely to uh, create the mental space necessary for self-care. All right. 
And then I would also have you get some feedback, right? Um, by that, I mean having sounding boards that you trust because they're an important part of personal growth. Uh, if you feel stuck on something, especially in the workplace, I want you to have peers that you feel safe enough with that you can consult and or a supervisor that you feel safe with, right? So that you can think out loud and bounce ideas off of without worrying about judgment or criticism, right, in return or misunderstanding, all right? Equally important, right, is advocating for your needs. And I don't want you to wait until you're at your wit's end before you say something to your boss and you're just kind of doing a verbal vomit of all your complaints, you know, in the workplace about all of the things that have been stressing you out, right? That's what we want to avoid that by advocating for your needs along the way as they arise. And uh, what, what does that look like? That looks like as soon as you identify that there's a need or a problem that threatens your productivity or your state of mind in the workplace, that you are seeking out appropriate channels to address those needs. doesn't mean that every time you have you're offended that you you go run into your boss. But what I mean is that if you have a substantial barrier to your productivity or something that you can't work your way around, then it's worth addressing and brainstorming that with your, with someone you trust in the workplace so that you can get back to business, right? And you'd be surprised really at how much support there probably is around you that you just haven't tapped into. Um, an example of that is EAPs. Most employers have an EAP or Employment Assistant Program where um, they will refer you to a therapist and your, your job will pay for it if you need, you know, to make sure that your mental health is in check. So that's good to keep in mind. You can also get peer support. Um, consult. Buddy up, right? Um, whatever works in your environment, just make sure it's that you are... Um, understanding that you're not an island, that we all have the same needs for the most part and similar challenges. So find out how others address their challenges and you might get some insight into things you haven't tried that you could use to solve yours. Chances are if you're stressed out about something in the workplace, you're not the only one that has had that challenge. And if you can find out how other people have managed that, especially if you're newer to that work environment or that employer, find some of the more seasoned workers that that are approachable and ask them how they managed this when they started at that job or that company, you know, in order to um, adjust well. Okay. And lastly, I know it's been a lot. The last thing I want you to remember in terms of self-care is the idea of balance, balancing all of these areas we've talked about, you know, the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, um, the workplace that you find a way to kind of keep these working for each other and not against each other um, and to keep your duties of the day your agenda balanced so you're not overloaded at any one point for too long you're gonna feel stress but I want that stress to be time limited so that when you toggle to the next area of your life you can change hats appropriately without without the stress spilling over into another area of your life and oftentimes this is that referred to as that work and home balance right and that's going to look different for every person whether they have a physical office they report to and then they clock out and they come home or if you're somebody who if you're an entrepreneur and you're working from home or if you have your own business you know it can get messy and so figuring out what that work life balance means to you is going to mean having rules that you are accountable to for yourself to make sure that you are keeping that balance. And um, like I said, it's a little bit easier if you have defined hours, but if you don't, you're going to have to work a little bit harder at making sure that you're taking care to attend to your top priorities, but also attending to your priorities in the home that are in line, again, with your value system. And uh, let some things take the back seat. You know, if, they, if they're not important and urgent. Um, okay. So hopefully that was helpful that um, all of the content that we covered here, probably not all of it applies to you, but definitely I hope you found some nuggets 
And if you found this information helpful, please do subscribe. And if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, you know, uh, I encourage you to uh, leave a comment, like, subscribe. If you're listening to this on the podcast, you know, I hope you're subscribed to the podcast and leave a review, you know, if you find this helpful. If there's anything that you want me to speak to directly, please do let me know and I'll add that to my content calendar. You can uh, do so using the the comments or you can shoot me something over on the contact me form there in the description. I have all the links right there. And uh, until next time, uh, keep making good things happen and go thrive. It's just a reminder that while I am a licensed therapist, I am not your therapist. If you need a professional, you can get one by going to Psychology Today and looking up Therapist Finder. And uh, again, this is for entertainment purposes only. All right, you can take care and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.